Summer's not here long, so seize the sizzle with Walmart. Find all your faves such as Oscar Mayer hot dogs, Kraft singles, and Heinz ketchup. This time of year is all about living easy and sizzling good food. Whether you're cooking for two or for a house full, grilling outside makes mealtime simple, delicious, and fun. When the coals are hot, be grill ready with all the best ingredients from Walmart. Summer's not here long, so seize the sizzle with Walmart. Find all your faves such as Oscar Mayer hot dogs, Kraft singles, and Heinz ketchup. This time of year is all about living easy and sizzling good food. Whether you're cooking for two or for a house full, grilling outside makes mealtime simple, delicious, and fun. When the coals are hot, be grill ready with all the best ingredients from Walmart. Presentamos Emerald Rain Refresh de Sherwin Williams, pintura formulada para deshacerse de la suciedad al contacto con el agua. Cuenta con excelente durabilidad y protección UV. Minimiza el mantenimiento para los dueños de casa con Emerald Rain Refresh de Sherwin Williams. I'm Justin Gosman. And I'm Gertie Bladar from the TCB cast. And you're listening to The Jungle Room with Jamie Kay and Mike Ford. Welcome to The Jungle Room Season 4, brought to you by Sassy Girl Apparel in Horn Lake, Mississippi. And now, here are your hosts, Mike Ford and Jamie Kay. Welcome, guys, to The Jungle Room. And guys, I am flying solo this week. That's right, Mike Ford is not here this week, but he will be back in The Jungle Room next week. So don't you worry, and I apologize that you only get me. So sorry. But it doesn't matter. We have a fantastic show for you guys. Remember last week we had John Daly on and we got into an in-depth conversation on the man Colonel Tom Parker. Now I told you it was going to be a two-parter because I just wasn't done learning more about him. I don't know about you guys, but everything that I thought I knew about Colonel Tom Parker has just been blown away. Seriously. I'm rethinking my original opinions on him. And the reason I say this is because our next guest is Mr. Charles Stone. Charles Stone was a tour producer for Elvis Presley and he worked up close and personal with Colonel Tom Parker. Not only did he work with Colonel Tom Parker, he also became good friends with him that that lasted until Colonel Tom Parker's death. I tend to believe someone who actually was there, who actually knew this man. And I am curious to find out what you guys think. I'm gonna go ahead and play this interview with Mr. Charles Stone right now. All right, welcome to the Jungle Room, and I am so excited to introduce you guys to our guest, Charles Stone. How are you? I am wonderful today. A little warm, but wonderful. Oh, yeah, I imagine. It's like 98 degrees down there in Texas, right? It sure is. (laughs) Now, Mr. Stone, you have had the pleasure to not only work for Colonel Tom Parker, but also Elvis Presley. Can you tell us how that came about? Well, the company I was working for was a company called Concerts West. And when Jerry Weintraub uh, obtained the rights for the Elvis tours, uh, he partnered with us because he was a manager and not a promoter. He managed Job Denver. So... Uh, I was in uh, Providence, Rhode Island with Frank Sinatra, and when we got the tour, Colonel Parker remembered a catfish restaurant outside of Montgomery, Alabama, that he wanted to go to, so he said, but Montgomery, well, at that time, it was a do-it-yourself venue. I had to hire bank tellers to run the box office, etc. when I was there with uh, Led Zeppelin in Chicago, so they called me uh, and at the Sumatra show and said, go to Montgomery tomorrow and put Elvis on sale. All right. I'm a rock and roller, and I grew up an Elvis fan. So I fly down and put, go hire my bank tellers and get ready to put the tickets on sale. Now, remember, there's no computers back then. It's one ticket at a time. Now, we had a 10-ticket limit, and it, you don't sell out in 20 minutes or 10 minutes like you do today. It took uh, maybe six to seven hours 
to sell out. So mm-hmm. when I called the phone number, I was supposed to call for a sell out. Someone answered and said, I'm going to speak to Jerry Lime Trauber, Tom Hewlett. And they said, he was calling? And I said, Charles Tom. He said, well, this is the colonel. Well, I'm locked up. I never expected to be talking to Colonel Parker. You know, he's a legend in our industry. So uh, he said, are you in the box office? I said, yes, sir. We're sold out. He says, I want you to open every drawer and see if there's any tickets left. I says, but Colonel, I've balanced my money against my manifest. Mr. Stone <laughs> got my attention. I, so I said, yes, sir. So I said, open and close the same drawer six times. I said, no, there's no tickets left. You did a good job on you need to come to California. And I'm supposed to go back to the Sinatra tour tomorrow, Colonel. He said, one moment. So Jerry Weintraub gets on the phone and says, Charlie, come out of here. And I'll send somebody else. So I fly to California that night. And I was there for, I think, eight or nine days. I only had four changes of clothes with me, so I recycled through the line. But, uh, the, you know, long story short, the Colonel took a liking to me, and from that day on, that's all I did was put together the Elvis tours and work with him. Elvis. So you got to know Colonel Tom Parker very well. How would you describe yes, him? <laughs> He's not the man that everybody thinks he is. I read all of these articles, etc. He robbed Elvis. He worked him to death. None of that is true. I, I witnessed firsthand uh, what he did for Elvis, and believe me, he was uh, he, he was good for Elvis. And don't forget, Elvis could have fired him at any time. Mm-hmm. He didn't have to keep the colonel. Okay. But the colonel kept Elvis on top his entire career. No other manager that I know has ever kept their artists on top for their entire career. But, uh, for example, whatever deal they made in the movies, we were in Lake Tahoe, and the colonel gets a phone call one morning, and it was from NBC TV. At that time, they didn't have cable. And, you know, they were just watching three or four different channels. And they'd have a primetime cancellation the next week. And they wanted to use one of Elvis's movies. I don't remember which one it was. But for whatever deal the colonel made when he made the movies, I heard him say, okay, you can have next week and one rerun for $750,000. Done deal. Well, before Elvis got out of bed that day, he made three quarters of a million dollars on something he did probably eight, nine years ago. That's a hell of a manager to make deals like that. Why do you think... Colonel Tom Parker gets such a bad rap. Well, I'm the manager of a couple of bands as well, and we have to wear the black hat. No matter what people say, we are the black hat. The artist has to maintain a good profile or a white hat with everybody in order to be an artist. He's not he's not the business. So he has to defer everything to the manager to be the bad guy. You know how many people try to get to El- were trying to get to Elvis during his career? Unbelievable. So somebody has to be the bad guy. And when I say bad guy, that's just taking care and covering covering Elvis, you know. Not uh, he's not doing things bad to Elvis, but he's keeping all the uh, whatever away from him. Taking care so of business, now. right? Yeah, t- taking care of business, absolutely. Colonel loved Elvis. He loved him as a son. I truly think that Elvis loved him as well. Otherwise, they wouldn't have stayed together that long. Uh, for example, uh, Colonel knew Elvis couldn't go to Japan, okay? So the Japanese came to uh, California one time, and the Colonel said, sit behind me for the meeting. I said, okay. So these two Japanese gentlemen came in with an interpreter and sat across the table from the Colonel. The Colonel put his hat on the table. All this time, we knew it. Elvis cannot go to Japan. He can't go do that. Why? And Why so, couldn't he go to Japan? Well, look what happened to Paul McCartney just for pot. Mm, you're talking he about the drugs. One, he, spent, he spent one year in jail down there. Mm, okay. So being a beetle didn't help him. So anyway, it was the guns and everything. It wasn't just the drugs. So anyway, the gentleman had a, a cashier's check for a million dollars. And they put it on the table. Colonel looked at it, took it, put it under his hat. Said, now, okay, now that you've taken care of the colonel, what are you going to pay Elvis? Ooh. And boy, the, the, the looks on their faces was priceless. But that's how 
how the colonel told them no. Now, did the colonel ever talk to Elvis about an opportunity to go to Japan, or did he keep that from him? Oh, we talked about Elvis going to England, Japan, everywhere, you know, and uh, <laughs> Elvis didn't really want to. Really? He was happy making all, oh, sure. It took us it took us three years to convince him to go to London and work over there, and that's, he passed before we were going, but I had reservations to fly to London and put Wembley Arena for the first time. They had seven days in a row available. We were going. But uh, the colonel wasn't going, uh, not just because he they call him an illegal alien. Don't forget, he served in the Army. Uh, he was, you know, he, he had a passport. I mean, didn't, he didn't have a passport because he didn't think he ever needed one. But uh, he also wasn't in the greatest health to go make a long flight like that either. Hmm. So... Tom Hewlett and I were going to do it because we do all this stuff anyway. And Elvis said, okay. But uh, convincing Elvis to do something, you know. But uh, you got to be careful when you go to some of these countries because whether you're Elvis or not, let me not just say, look at Paul McCartney. You got to be careful. What was the dynamic between Elvis Presley and his manager, Colonel Tom Parker? I'm only going to have to say this, that anytime they had a discussion about any business or anything like that, Nobody else was ever in the room. So if anybody says I heard him say this, that's wrong. Uh, but uh, every time they had to do business, they go off by themselves and come back. But uh, I can tell you, the colonel looks after Elvis like nobody else. And they said, oh, he took half the Elvis's money. No, he didn't. He took 25% commission. And in the end, they did dissolve their manager or agent uh, agreement and became partners in a company. At which point, the colonel made less money because of how it was structured and all the expenses off the top. So, uh, you know, I don't know. It just, uh, but he, he just gets a bad rap. But mm-hmm. I, I witnessed him take such good care of Elvis that made Elvis so much money. You and I have a mutual friend, John Daly, and he was on last week. And he made the comment that colonel had once said, that there's a bad guy in every story, and he was willing to be the bad guy in Elvis's story. In other words, to protect Elvis's image. Do you find that to be true? Well, yeah, the exact words the Colonel used was, and this is after Elvis passed, in order for the fans to make Elvis a god, they have to make me the devil. Mm-hmm. And I will wear that hat for Elvis. Colonel never in his entire life ever said a negative or bad word about Elvis Presley, ever. And on the interview he did with Ted Koppel, and if you go back and listen to it, the colonel says straight out, nobody tells Elvis what to do. Nobody. Mm-hmm. Not even the colonel didn't tell Elvis what to do. You know, he'd say, this is all we got. Do you want to do it? How involved was Colonel Tom Parker in Elvis's personal life? Not at all. They were friends, I mean, I guess on a personal level from all the years, but did they mingle socially? People say, well, why didn't Elvis ever do a serious movie? I happen to tell you because we, Colonel and I, went over to Hal Wallace's house for dinner one night. You know who Hal Wallace is? Yes, sir. Okay. And we're having dinner, and I decided, don't forget that. Keep in mind, I'm in my late 20s. (laughs) I'm a kid. Mm -hmm. So we're having dinner, and I I decided to say, I'm going to go for it. What the hell? So I said, Mr. Wallace, can I ask you a question? I see the colonel button up like, oh, God, you know. I said, how come Elvis never took a serious role in a movie? He said, well, Charles, that's an easy answer. No studio would ever finance it. Never let Elvis go to get in the movie and not sing. I'm mean, going to take the greatest singer in the world and put him in it with you and not let him sing. He said, as simple as that, no studio with an answer. So that's from the horse's mouth on that one. Mm. How would you describe the colonel? A gentle giant, I think is the best way to describe him. Mm-hmm. He was a, uh, a very gentle person to the people that he uh, liked and got close to. Not a lot of people got close to were close to the colonel. Because everybody wanted to use him to get close to Elvis. So therefore, you know, you got to gain his trust. I remember driving him from Palm Springs to Los Angeles with my family. And my daughter uh, was in the car. She was, I think, six or seven at the time. And 
he told her nursery rhyme stories and just stuff all the way, entertainment all the way. And, you know, that's a that's spectacular marker I wish people could see. Right. When I hear, when I hear people talk about Colonel Screw and Elvis Alavis did this, he's evil, whatever. I said, man, that is not the man that I knew. Mm-hmm. But, you know, sometimes you can talk to a wall and it ain't going to talk back. Or sometimes the wall will listen. And a lot of the fans are not going to hear about Colonel Parker. Right. Uh, you know, you know, people are going to believe what they want to believe. Now, after Elvis dies, how much contact did you have with Colonel Tom Parker? If I had a second father, it would have been the Colonel. Uh, I have to tell you, I think we uh, developed a relationship that became very close to family. There was never a birthday ever go by that he didn't pick up the phone and call and play it on a harmonica and wish every member of my family a happy birthday. Uh, when I say I think he was a gentle giant, uh, but he made, uh, you know, he made Elvis and uh, kept, him, kept him on top his entire career. What other manager would have turned down the Beatles and, and kept Elvis? And he could have had the Beatles and Elvis at, at one time. Oh, wow. I didn't know that either. Mm-hmm. Yep, sure did. I saw the telegrams in his office and uh, he said, I only handle one artist at a time. When was the last time you spoke with Colonel Tom Parker? Probably a week before he passed. I would call him a minimum at least once a week. We'd, we'd talk on the phone, even if it's for three or four minutes or five minutes. Uh, we'd talk, or he'd call me, or I'd call him. We just became uh, became family. You know, my wife and I would go to Vegas. We would all go out to dinner with him and, and, and Loanne, and just spend the whole weekend together. I, I loved him. I loved the man. I have to tell you, I loved him and, and the stories he told. You know, and not just Elvis, but before Elvis, the Colonel knew what he was doing. He had other artists, you know, Eddie Arnold, Hank Snow. He made stars out of them. So when they say that uh, that was as lucky to get the Colonel, yes, he was. Do you remember any of the stories that you could share with us? Oh, oh, absolutely. And actually, one of them, I have to tell you, the Colonel always had a knack of knowing what to say at the right time. And this is one. This was when Elvis was working. We were in a city, and I won't name the city. But we were sitting backstage. Now, the colonel didn't stay for too many shows. He normally stayed one day ahead. So we were sitting backstage. The first half of the show just finished, and the fire marshal comes around. He said, Charles, I need to talk to you. I said, come said, uh, we've had a bomb scare. We have to empty the building. I said, you're kidding me. You know, we got 10,000 people in here. No way. I said, he said, yeah, we do. I said, well, look, you need to go tell the colonel that, not me. So he goes over. The colonel's sitting backstage, sitting on a chair, got his hand up on his cane. Elvis is not there yet. Mm-hmm. And he tells the colonel, we got a, we got a bomb scare, colonel. We're going to have to empty the building. Oh, really? Charlie, call Elvis and tell him to turn around and go back to the hotel. We're not we're not going to have a show tonight. So the colonel gets up and starts walking out the door. And the bomb officer says, where are you going, colonel? He says, oh, there's a bomb scare. I'm getting out of here. <laughs> and he says, well, uh, well, well, maybe it's not the real one. That's okay. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but that's how he handled that one. That was priceless. I mean, that is priceless. Do you remember where you were when you got the news that Elvis had died? Oh, I'm sure I did. Oh, very vividly. I was in Colonel's office in Portland, Maine, at the uh, Sheraton Hotel. I was actually on the phone booking Hershey Arena in Hershey, Pennsylvania, for another tour. And the Colonel says, "Hang up, Charlie." I said, "Well, Colonel, I'm booking." He said, "Hang up." So I told the guy, "So I call you back." And he called us in there and uh, told us, and it uh, well, it just what a shocker, you know. Do you remember Colonel's reaction? I mean, how there's been so many people who have said not so nice things about the way Colonel acted at Elvis's funeral, or 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 just soon after. What would you what would you say he was like after Elvis died? Oh, he he took care of Elvis for I think two years. He you know he took care of Vernon and Elvis. Vernon kept him home, and uh, he took care of the business for I think almost two years after Elvis passed away. And everybody says, well, he he didn't wear a suit to Elvis's uh, funeral. Colonel didn't even own a suit. He never wore a suit in his life. And like you know, he said Elvis wouldn't expect me to not to not go and be myself, and that's true. Mm. So, but, you know, everybody 
he didn't wear a suit. He did this, he did that. Uh, he continues to take care of that was his business. But uh, I don't know. You can't live up to everybody's expectations, you know. That's true. That is true. What would you like Elvis fans to know about your friend, Colonel Tom Parker? He wasn't the bad guy that everybody portrays him out to be. Uh, don't forget, whenever he got Elvis off the of Sun Records onto RCA and they started making the movies, nobody else had made the movie soundtrack. So the Colonel recorded all the songs and put them out on an album. And the Colonel made merchandise. Oh, my God. He merchandised all of the shows. Now, there was a few people had done a little bit, but nothing to the magnitude that Colonel did for Elvis merchandise everywhere. Uh, you know, he he so he set the records for everything with Elvis Presley, and that'll, that'll never happen again to anybody else. But if he was your friend and he told you something, you don't need it in writing. That's a done deal. I want to thank Charles Stone for being here in the Jungle Room studio to tell his story, to talk about his friend, Colonel Tom Parker. I think it's only fair to give all sides of every situation. And you guys can make your own minds up. But I encourage you to do your own research and listen to the people that were actually there. Okay? All right. Coming up next after the break is music by Heather Lomax and a special contest announcement. Summer festival for this year for 2020 is going to be at the Holiday Inn on Elvis Presley Boulevard. It's going to be from August the 11th through the 15th. It is a free event. Every single day it's a free event. We actually will be having a very large sale this year of books and memorabilia and records and buttons. I'm talking like dollar records, dollar buttons, very inexpensive things. There will also be an Elvis mini museum of some things that have never before been on exhibit before. So if you're in Memphis for Elvis week, please stop by the Holiday Inn. Come in and say hi. We're going to have multiple uh, guests that you can meet, books that you can buy to be signed, photos that you can buy to be signed, lots of great deals, lots of specials, and lots of really cool Elvis memorabilia that you just aren't going to be able to find anywhere else. So we hope to see you. If you can't make it to Elvis Week, please visit our website, epboulevard, B-L-V-D, pawnshop.com. So it's E-P-B-L-V-D, pawnshop.com. When it comes to embroidery, screen print, vinyl, trophies, baby and ladies apparel, there's only one place to go. That's Sassy Girl Apparel. You can call them at 662-280-8020. Find them on Facebook at Sassy Girl Apparel. Email them at sgastore at yahoo.com. When it comes to embroidery, screen print, vinyl, trophies, baby and ladies apparel, nobody beats Sassy Girl Apparel. Hi, this is Ashley Drew from the YouTube channel Ashley Drew, and I love listening to The Jungle Room with Mike Ford and Jamie Kay. Don't if I trust you, but I love you just the same. Been bitten by so many dogs, thought that they were too.
That was What Don't Kill Ya by Heather Lomax. Her new CD, All This Time, is now available. Check her out at heatherlomaxmusic.com. Now, if you were wondering what events to participate in during Elvis Week 2020, there is a special event happening August 12th at the Hugh Hotel. It's an evening with Ginger Alden presented by Sarah Madison and sponsored by Elvis Matters. If you've been following this event, you know it is sold out. But we have someone on the line right now who has a very cool announcement. Sarah Madison, you've been very busy putting this event together, so we appreciate you taking the time out to share with our listeners something good. And boy, we could use some good news right now. So go ahead, Sarah. Tell us some good news. Oh, I've got some good news for everyone, Jamie. Some exciting news, especially during these difficult times that we've been going through. We all need a little bit of a break and happiness. So without further delay, I want to let you guys know that I have two tickets that we are going to be giving away for the event with an evening at Ginger Alden at the Hugh Hotel, August 12th. And uh, we're going to do the raffle through your show. Well, it's not really going to be a raffle. Okay, you contest. You have, have to work for it. But, but tell us, Sarah, now this work that they have to do, is it going to be hard labor? Is this something that's going to be very challenging? I don't think we can handle any more challenging things right now. So it's going to be fun. It's going to be upbeat. It's going to uh, invoke the imagination of the mind of Elvis Presley. Um, I think that it's going to be rewarding as well and a lot of fun. All right. So this contest is called Caption This. Now, if you are a member of the Jungle Room Facebook group page, if you're not, you should be. We are going to post a picture of Elvis Presley and you guys are going to caption that picture. Now, we will choose a winner. Someone who blows us away with their caption skills. We're looking for something unique, something funny, something positive. And we will announce the winner next week. Now, you guys, you have to be a member of the Jungle Room Facebook group page to be eligible to win this contest. Now, Sarah, are there any other rules that our listeners need to know about? Hmm. Just have fun. Oh, we need that right now, right? We need that. We really need that. Just have fun. Kind of, kind of put yourself in, in, in Elvis mode and, and dive deep into his mind and try and figure out what he's thinking or saying or feeling in the picture. And we need to remember that Elvis had a sense of humor. So you guys remember that when you're posting your caption, funny is always good in good taste. <laughs> and I need to clarify that. Yes, in good taste. All right, Sarah, thank you so much. Now, you guys, remember, an evening with Ginger Alden is happening August 12th at the Hugh Hotel. It is presented by Sarah Madison and sponsored by Elvis Matters. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Jamie, for having me on your show. I'm looking forward to reading a lot of these captions. It's going to be fun. Me too. Me too. I hope we will be doing a lot of laughing. I do. I think we all will. I hope so. <laughs> all right, guys. There you have it. You have the information you need to win a pair of tickets to an evening with Ginger Alden. Now, if you have not joined the Jungle Room Facebook group page, I encourage you to do so because I am getting ready to post that picture up right now for you guys to enter. And guys, make it funny. Make it memorable. This is fun, and I think you guys are going to have a lot of fun with it. I will put the directions on the Jungle Room page that everyone has access to, and it will direct you to our group page. Okay, guys, this wraps up another episode of the Jungle Room podcast. Oh, I don't like it when I have to do this alone. It feels weird. <laughs> I really miss Mike when he's not here. But he will be back next week. And next week, we have a fantastic guest. We have Manswell Peterson. He is an author, and he's a huge Elvis Presley fan. But he's also a huge Roy Hamilton fan. So I know Justin Gosman from the TCB Cast podcast is going to love next week's episode. Can't wait for you guys to hear that. That's all coming up next week. So I hope to have you guys back here in the Jungle Room studio 
along with myself and Mike Ford. Until next time. And you're listening to the Jungle Room Podcast. There's a pretty little thing waiting for the king down in the jungle room. You've worked so hard for all the things you have. The salary, the status, the success. And with that image, there's a drink. One to unwind, one to loosen up, one to take the edge off. But how do you know when a drink is more than just a drink? We get it. We can help. Karen's Grandview program has been helping accomplished people just like you regain their lives. Talk to us. Visit karen.org slash grandview.